if I go two times more to the North Pole or 10 times more, it will not improve the world in any significant way. But the inspiration I get or the insight I get from it, I might transfer and, and, and make a difference on the planet to to the people around me and to myself and, and hopefully to the world, hopefully one day. That was Polar Expedition Leader Inga Solheim, and this is the Brendan Carr Podcast. Today my guest is Inga Solheim. Inga is considered one of the world's leading guides. Inga was the expedition leader for Prince Harry's charity, Walking with the Wounded. He guided the prince and wounded soldiers to the North Pole in 2011 and to the South Pole in 2013. Today, Inga and I have an amazing conversation about being in tune with oneself, with nature, and with the people around you. Here we go. You're often doing a lot of training. You're you're leading people in training. What is what does a normal session like that look for you? So we try to uh, we try to work out and train relevant to what uh, we're planning to do. So mm-hmm. if we're planning to climb a mountain, we we go climbing and and training with rope works and uh, and uh, using the equipment and and uh, physical general physical training. I try to push people very hard during the training so that the expedition is easy. And mm. when we go to the North Pole, we do the same, but more uh, core core fitness uh, training uh, with uh, pulling tires or pulling a ski, like pulling a polk or something like a sled behind you uh, when we train for the North or South Pole or crossing Greenland or something like that. And for uh, for the kind of skiing that I did this weekend, it's just you need hours on skis. And uh, and a general uh, core fitness. Yeah. So how how do you know then how to how hard to train people if you're trying to make it so that the the final event is easy? How do you measure that out when you're working with someone? My job is to to bridge the gap between between people's ambition and their ability. Mm. Uh, that's how I try to see it. And uh, I get to know people well during the training and and interviewing them where they are today, how much they want things, uh, what they've done before, and then testing them. Uh, I find out if if there's a mis- mis- mismatch between what they think and what the reality is. And the uh, different kind of uh, background uh, is, uh, yeah, so s- some people can have a lot of gym training and gym background, mm-hmm. and, but not the kind of... Uh, robustness that you need to work hard in nature uh, so i need to tweak their training regime over to be more relevant to what we're going to do later yeah and what do you mean when when you say robustness the robust has become m- more and more important word for me because i like i was thinking strong before or fit and and uh, all of that and <clears throat> i've had i've had uh, olympic athletes on on expeditions and uh, they are, they're, they're like miles, miles uh, 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 more fit. They're like they're so much more fit than than other people, but they are, are not always robust. You know, they are working mm. under. They're used to competing under ideal conditions and training under ideal conditions with a with a, a kind of a service uh, uh, organization behind them and stuff like that. And then when you put them out in in nature where they can get cold uh, they can they work over much longer time and and things are changing they don't respond so well to it so by robustness i mean you're physically strong uh, your body has been working hard over longer time so that uh, your ligaments and your ligaments and your bones and your muscles are used to working hard over a longer time and then the most important thing is the mental robustness that you actually uh, can pick yourself up when you had a little crisis. You, when you're tired and hungry or scared, you can uh, you can lift yourself up and and remote re remotivate yourself. Wow, that's a mental robustness. So, how can a person build more of that then through through training? Well, I, I think uh, I think uh, different people can do it different ways, but. In, in general, I think uh, people need to test themselves more uh, under safe conditions. So don't go out and do something 
uh, stupid, like you, uh, take too much, um, ch- too many chances and stuff like that. But go out and, and push yourself, push your mental and physical uh, l- limits or boundaries, uh, move them and uh, try to do it under safe conditions. Maybe work, work and work out with people that are stronger and more experienced than you so that you have to push yourself but you still have a little bit of a safety net. And uh, I, I don't think there's any shortcut or easy way to become mentally robust. It takes years or takes some time. Um, uh, some people have it from childhood and other people have been uh, uh, living in a very protected uh, environment and, and in protected life. And, and I don't think it's possible to become physically and mentally robust without uh, facing challenges. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and you kind of stepped out of what you might think of sort of a, a protected environment career wise. You were, you were in finance for a while and then you've, you made this, this jump into being a guide. How did you make that transition? Uh, for, for me, that was, uh, going back to my roots and, uh, uh, for, you know, I grew up in the mountains in Norway, very fortunate to, to be, able to live and, and um, test myself outdoors since I was a very young guy. And um, I had that in my blood. That's where I, uh, out there is where I built my character, my confidence, my self-image was in nature. Mm. And um, for many years I worked hard. I, I owned a pizza restaurant. I was working you know, with some video rental. I I, did, I worked in a shop for a while, but I went into finance because uh, the money and the status was very attractive to me. And so for for eight, nine years, I worked in finance and that was challenging in many ways, but it didn't really appeal to my, to my nature and uh, I didn't get enough time outdoors and to push myself physically and mentally outdoors. So I always had this longing back to nature. When the weather was nice outside of my office window, I was I was dreaming about being outdoors. When the weather was really bad outside, I was dreaming even more about being outdoors to sort of <laughs> feel the elements and stuff like that. And uh, so one day I just decided to, to quit and I told my boss and he was absolutely convinced that I had a better offer from, from another stockbroker or something like that. But it wasn't uh, anything like that. But he still gave me gardening leaves to to make sure that I didn't go straight to a competitor. Mm. And that gardening leave was nice for me to just um, to just uh, yeah chill with full payment. So it was nice. Um, but I I was I left finance where I made a lot of money, and for the the first ten years of working as a guide, I didn't make much. So. So it looked kind of stupid for people around me, but it felt right for me. Yeah, and and one thing you you mentioned several times in there is your your connection with nature, and I've even heard you say, "I am nature." What does that yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah, it it is um, it's something that I I'm trying to convince people around me that they are nature. Uh, I feel like nature uh, as I'm as much nature as uh, an animal or a tree or the bacteria in, in my stomach, we are nature and we are much more interconnected and dependent uh, with the other species in nature than we understand. So we can be domesticated, urbanized, uh, civilized and all that stuff. But we still, we st- we're still dependent on air, uh, food, mm. we're water. And, uh, and that interdependency, this connection... I think is the solution for everything. If we, if we reconnect, we understand our effect, the effect we have on nature and, and the effect that the rest of nature has on us. I think that uh, we will find inspiration and will and courage to do what it takes to, to make this world better because we have, we have uh, not been treating our planet well the last uh, 150 200 years and we need to change that but that change that change can be quite as a painful in ge- uh, uh, change in general is painful um, mm. but dramatic change in our consumption our 
uh, thoughts and behavior patterns and all of that to to save this planet will be uncomfortable and painful for us, but it's absolutely necessary. So uh, human beings, uh, I've found, at least grown-up human beings, only train, only change through strong inspiration or desperation. And uh, I think um, we need to we need to play on both uh, both of them. We we need to make people inspired to to do the change. We need to uh, show that the situation will be desperate if we don't do the right things today. And um, I think I think there are many many things that we have to do simultaneously. But it all starts with personal responsibility. We all have to do more and better. Is there is there something that uh, that inspired you in particular, or was there a, a desperation that you felt about this this need to protect nature? I don't think I've reached desperation uh, yet uh, because I'm a chronic optimist. <laughs> I think that we can so, we can solve this. I think there is there are more good people and more wise people in this world than than um, than the opposite. Um, I think technology can help us a little bit, but more more importantly, we have to understand, we have to share share the resources better between us. Uh, we have to take care of uh, each other and the local environment around us, and that will have a global effect. Mm-hmm. I I think that um, I think that the the Growing the the, the up uh, and coming generation, uh, the the young people today are wiser and better informed and and less corrupt than than my generation and, and older. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about that. And and these guys will will change things. I think they will take money out of politics. I think they will expose corruption on every level. I think they will push the establishment out and build new um, power structures. Hopefully they will be better and, uh, and, and, uh, and wiser than the previous ones. And one thing on a, a more specific level that, that you're doing to, to tackle this is your work with the um, more environmentally conscious uh, cruise ships. What's, what's that about? Uh, so a few years ago, I, uh, a friend of mine told me about his uh, plans to build uh, the next generation of cruise ships because he said that what's being built today is uh, not very environmentally friendly. They're they're using too much fuel, uh, not cleaning the fuel enough. Uh, they are so sound pollution, uh, air pollution, ocean mm-hmm. pollution from these cruise ships is is bad, and I think the whole uh, maritime industry is uh, polluting way too much and of course they are driven by the un- like the never ending demand of transportation of uh, cars and goods and uh, and uh, commodities and, and uh, that's our our shared responsibility we're consuming too much and we're transporting way too much uh, fuel and and uh, jeans and whatever um so that, that that's our shared responsibility. But through legislation, through best showing best practice, through many different ways, we have to clean up the maritime industry. And my friend, who's a, who's been a cruise ship owner for many years, and and a, a, a great guy that I know, Atle, he um, he showed me his plans for next generation of cruise ships, and it really inspired me. And now. Uh, one month ago, we contracted this cruise ship with a Dutch shipyard, and we're building this with uh, very uh, fuel efficient and clean fuel and uh, cleaning mechanisms and the battery packs so that our electric uh, uh, diesel electric engines can run cleaner and better and charge batteries so that if we're going into, into Galapagos or uh, into the Norwegian fjords, we can do so on battery power. We have also prepared this ship to take different kinds of uh, uh, of fuel that are like uh, biodiesel and and stuff like that. The most important thing here, keeping the ships small, so the uh, manageable size, and that our footprint when we land on a 
a distant shore somewhere, we leave no uh, no uh, no environmental footprint behind. And I think our ship will be an example to follow for other cruise ship builders and, and we'll share, share the stories and our experience so that uh, this cruise ship will be a role model for the next generation of our cruise ships that we're, will be keep, keep um, improving. Um, and then uh, maybe other people in the business, other companies will also follow this example. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I, I think so often when, when people talk about things like oil, for example, we, we think of our cars that we drive around, but air travel, you know, cruises, things like that also are consuming and affecting the environment in a, in a big way. Um, you, Huge way. Yeah. Do, do you have a suggestion for people who, who want to be more conscious about their travel? People who are like you, they, they love the outdoors, they love to get around, but they want to be more conscious about that kind of thing? I think there are many ways to, to do that. And um, so uh, transportation, uh, the, the way we travel is, is important. For myself, I can tell you that I'm, my environmental uh, footprint is, uh, uh, my travel footprint is way too big. And, and um, I want to find other better ways to, to travel. I think that if we, through our um, consumer power we choose suppliers uh, airlines and and uh, ship uh, like uh, cruise ships or transportation services that are that are more environmentally conscious we can turn the whole industry around to be more environmentally conscious they are running their businesses with excel sheets more than heart <laughs> so they will see that if the demand is bigger for the environmentally friendly options they will they will move their business in that direction. Uh, we also have to use our voting rights, so we have to elect more environmentally conscious, uh, honest, strong, and brave leaders that will make the necessary changes to in legislation in laws of how to build uh, planes and ships and stuff like that. Uh, and and we have to get money out of politics so that uh, so that uh, businesses can't own politicians mm. because that's that's the really dangerous uh, slippery slope that uh, some countries I won't mention any but some countries <laughs> have gone way too far in the wrong direction. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so and and then we then we just have to uh, be more conscious about how we consume how we travel. Um, I have a, a good friend called Bertrand Picard who is uh, doing a big job now to to find the thousand solutions for a more sustainable future. And many of these solutions are on transportation. And he he did himself a test run around the around our uh, planet, where he circumnavigated the Earth with uh, a, a plane called Solar Impulse on purely solar power. He uh, circumnavigated the Earth. And uh, that's a that's a good example on where technological innovation and uh, determination can can bring us a better future. Wow, oh, that's that's incredible. I I know before um, before while we were setting up this interview, um, Ashley and I told you in some emails that we, we circumnavigated the globe, but we did it by traditional means. And and like you said, my my carbon footprint from that journey is probably enormous when I think of you know, flying yeah. all the way around the entire world. I think that you could do that with a, with a cleaner source is amazing. We, we definitely can. There is, there's uh, at least one or 20 technological solutions or practical solutions to most of the environmentally um, damaging things that we humans do. We can produce clothes, clothes and food in more environmentally friendly with a lower footprint. When, when I say footprint, I'm, I'm not only talking about CO2. CO2 is the sort of the villain in the story here, but the, <laughs> it's much more complex than that. Uh, I think that glo the global focus on CO CO2 and ice melting and global warming is a bit of a smokescreen uh, that uh, politicians and business leaders are hiding behind to avoid uncomfortable questions about uh, tangible things that they can do something about how they produce their products, uh, how we produce our power, um, how we, uh, what kind of fuel we use, and all sorts of things. And 
and uh, that smoke screen is uh, uh, so the the louder and more people talk about global warming the more these businesses and politicians uh, can hide behind uh, blurry talk about uh, global warming we have to be more concrete we can still talk about global warming but global warming would be if if it if 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 that's our end goal to to stop global warming that would happen if we did all the other all the other things better if we produced uh, uh, energy more clean if we changed our consumption and production of uh, of uh, goods if we ate better uh, more environmentally friendly i that that whole global thing global warming thing uh, would would be solved but mm. nobody wants to talk about concrete things and especially not politicians or business leaders because they don't want to be held accountable to anything. They just want to have, uh, to, they want to sound environmentally friendly in their speeches. Yeah, to play on those buzzwords, like you said, like global warming yeah. and things. Oh, they love that. But uh, we're like talking about uh, one or two degrees up or down or, or CO2 footprint or, or, or carbon credits and, and other fake things. Like carbon credits is a, is a fake cons. Uh, uh, like uh, like a fake market to make people feel better or or to to uh, I think it's a I think it's a big mistake. Uh, we have to we have like taxing taxing your gasoline is not the solution. If we had brave politicians, we would promote environmentally friendly solutions. We would uh, stop giving tax breaks to. Uh, uh, to big oil companies, and it, the whole change would have already happened. But uh, as long as we have corrupt politicians and uh, and um, greedy business people, nothing will change. I'm sorry about my Norwegian directness, but uh, <laughs> yeah, if, if you wanna if you wanna talk about like uh, like nice things and and uh, no, <laughs> no, you I... just le- lead me into something different. But when we come to this, I think. Uh, I can be an alternative voice. Yes, I, I admire this so much. And and it's it's interesting that, that carbon credits are, are something that you mentioned. Do you know Alex Honnold, or you know of him, the, uh, the, yeah, the yeah, free climber? I, yeah. I saw an interview with him recently where he was talking about how he used to, he flies a lot, and he used to buy carbon credits to offset things. But he's yeah. realized that it, it doesn't quite make the difference that he was hoping for. So now he's starting his own nonprofit and, and trying yeah. to, like you suggest, take more of a personal responsibility for and, the topic. And do, some, and do something concrete. Um, mm-hmm. uh, most of uh, carbon credit money uh, disappears in the financial system and uh, this, this uh, uh, kind of uh, exchange. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't really, is not used like your taxes like your environmental taxes on on fuel or or cars or whatever it's not used where they have an effect very little um it's more like a shadow boxing like pretending to do good and uh, if politicians and businesses were really really wanted to do something real they would for example uh, change leg- le- legislation they would stop stop um, subsidizing the the polluting industries and uh, and like the world came together and banned free on gas we should more we should do more things like that hmm. like bi- big bold uh, big uh, bold uh, statements and and uh, and brave uh, yeah brave things mm-hmm. all the other stuff is just uh, pretending to to do good but it doesn't we could put out we have the resources the technology but we don't have the will to put out uncontrolled the fires in coal mines for example Mm. huge polluter Mm. uh, spewing out uh, not only co2 but poisonous uh, uh, gases in their local environment and polluting our atmosphere there are at any time lots of uncontrolled fires uh, burning in coal mines all over the world especially china I think maybe some in Australia as well, but especially China. And um, we could we could put those fires out. We have technology and we know how to do that. But it's costing more than it is to just move and 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 drill or or dig somewhere else. 
Um, mm. So they're just keeping them burning for years. Mm. And and we, we can do so many things to, to, um, to pollute less, but there's no will for it. And, and uh, like I live in Norway, uh, we have a good uh, PR machinery working to, to uh, make us look environmentally friendly here. <laughs> and um, it works. People think it's a very conscious, environmentally friendly, friendly and conscious country. But when you look at it, um, we struck oil in 1969. That was our lottery ticket. We became the richest country in the world. We travel more. We consume more. We we export more oil and gas, and we have the biggest shipping fleet, the biggest uh, tanker fleet, the biggest uh, cruise ship fleet is on Norwegian hands or controlled by Norwegian companies. Our environmental footprint is massive per capita. Nobody talks about it. We even have a heavy in- industry in Norway, and nobody talks about that uh, CO2 footprint or, or environmental footprint. I'm sorry I mentioned CO2, uh, but... <laughs> We, with the respo- with the, with the privilege of being the richest country in the world, I feel that we have a greater responsibility to do what is right. So, my dream scenario would be if we invested some of our huge sovereign fund in environmental technology, in clean energy sources, uh, in research and development of uh, of uh, environmentally sa- and, uh, or, or energy saving technology. Uh, aff- affordable, environmentally friendly houses in the different parts of the world, and th- and things like that. And if we also used our position on the global geopolitical scene to influence other countries to do better and more, I, I think we should do that. But we, our politicians, are too weak to, too weak to do that. So. Yeah, so Norwegian companies, they typically, the things they're not allowed to do in Norway, they go and do in Angola, uh, or they invest in, in fracking or tar sand in, um, in Canada and the US. And that's our companies. If we try to do anything like that in Norway, it would be shut down immediately mm. because our environmental, our environmental laws in Norway are very strong. But our state company, um, uh, in, uh, energy company and and other Norwegian companies are doing abroad what what they're not allowed to do in Norway, which is morally corrupt. Mm. Yeah, Inga, it seems something you, you keep coming back to is is responsibility, and it it also seems to be part of your philosophy for training and guiding people through these expeditions. I I saw you in a recent interview with Esquire. You said something along the lines of. You know, it's good to do your best, and that's nice, and your mom will be proud. But if you're working with me, I need you to do what it takes. What did you mean yeah. by that? It sounds really brutal because uh, people are people have grown up, and and uh, this I did my best, or she did her best, or he did his best. That's something we've all heard, and and in many ways, in many cases, that's that's good enough. Uh, and especially when you're a kid, that's good enough. You, you do your best um, on your exam or your your drawing or in sports. Uh, I, I like the idea of that. You you do your best. I, I think the focus needs to change a little bit when you grow up. You need to look at what does it take to reach the goal or to do the job. And then you focus on that. Because most people don't know what their best is. When they think mm. they've done their best, they still have a lot more potential and capacity left. Uh, whether it's in, uh, in intellectual capacity or physical capacity. So most people don't know what their best is. So if you're aiming for what you think is your best, you will completely undershoot your potential you, I don't know if that's even an English word undershoot uh, yeah. you will not reach your potential if you focus on what's your best you can do so much more and if 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 the job is to uh, climb Mount Everest or to do something not physical but something intellectual and that the requirement is is uh, is X if you do anything less than X you're failing so you have to focus on doing what it takes. Maybe you have to do a gap analysis. 
what is the difference between where I have to what I have to reach and where I am today and then you you sort of uh, find out what you need to do not what you want to do what is comfortable to do what you like to do that doesn't count like you you will not reach your goal if you focus on what your best is you have to you have to do what is required and and this quote uh, the first time I heard this I've been feeling it my whole life but the first time I heard it put in into words was a, an old quote from Winston Churchill uh, from the war where he he said to the English people uh, the British people he said uh, sometimes doing your best is not enough you have to do what is requ- required and I've mm. sort of taken those words and and applied them to to not everything I do sometimes I'm a lazy uh, guy as well um, and I accept mediocrity in myself <laughs> I hate to say that, but uh, most of the time, if I have if I have a task in in front of me, I will try to find out what I need to do, and then I'll do that. Do you have uh, maybe an example of when when you've had to hold someone you've been working with to this kind of standard, and how you how you've worked through that? Very often on uh, training or expeditions, uh, people tell me that they can't do more. Uh, I can't, I can't make it, or they they lose faith in themselves or their ability to do something. And um, s- sometimes my job is to for so people are different. So some people respond well to uh, a nice uh, chat about it, where I tell them I I think you can do it, and uh, remember why we wanted to do this, and and I'm try- trying to inspire them. Uh, other people respond to different things, so I just kick their butt and say, <laughs> "Like, uh, uh, get your sorry ass up from the that rock and and keep walking, uh, and stop feeling sorry for yourself." Uh, and and they respond well to that. So m- I I need to know my group or my expedition companions. I need to know them so well that I, I can I can. Um, try to inspire them in the way that that works for them but sometimes um you just have to push push yourself and people through things it's not always a popularity contest you know you you, you, if you want extraordinary results you have to do extraordinary things you have to push yourself beyond and uh, most people in our modern society uh, at least on a physical level they don't do that um push themselves beyond anything they're they're too comfortable and comfortable makes you lazy and uh, not robust Hmm. so how how do you get a read then for who you can who you can tell to get off the rock and who you have to kind of work with because you you've you've worked with such a diverse set of people you've literally worked with princes you've worked with prince harry but you've you've worked with um, people who are so-called disabled uh, veterans how do you how do you read different people you're very accurate with different people because they're they're all people and they're all individuals so first of all we make the mistake sometimes to treat people uh, as uh, like as they are a group so we talk about disabled people we, we have an image of what that is and and that they are less capable or less able to do something I found the opposite. Hmm. Uh, we talk about royals and we think that that's, that's a type of people. But they're all individuals. We all are. And um, we all deserve to be treated individually. And, uh, and um, that's what I try to do. I try to see everyone as individuals and try to learn as much as possible about them. And um, when I can, I will adapt and and uh and uh, yeah what to say um when it's possible i will adjust and adapt to to the individual sometimes the group responsibility to the group is greater than the emotions of the individual so sometimes i am quite brutal when someone tries to give up on me or comes up with excuses and explanations because i'm quite allergic to it (laughs) Uh, and then then the democracy and the and the niceness goes out of the window 
and, and I say things as they are or as I see them. Not always the truth, but if I'm leading a group, I have to trust my instinct and, and do what I think it takes. And But most of the time, I'm leaning back, and because of the uh, thorough training and preparations, people lead their own expeditions, and they remotivate themselves and remotivate each other. And uh, this works, and, and, and I think at least three out of four expeditions work that way where um, we have prepared so well that that my job is not to walk in front and, and tell them what to do or show them where to go. I'm just leaning back and, and facilitating uh, and, and like a safety net. And and so much of this comes down then to your, your instinct and your, your sense of what's going on. How do you get in touch with that? Does that come through experience or do you have um, a mindfulness practice or is it just through solitude, time in nature? What What brings that out in you? What gets you in touch with that? I, I think it's a combination. For, first of all, I have to say I'm not always perfect and I'm not always right when I do things and, and when I'm out on these expeditions. For me, it's a learning, it's a lifelong learning thing where I'm I'm responding differently today than I did to things two years ago or, or 20 years ago. So I, I think that's a really, um, it's a lifelong thing and I'm not, I, I'm, I, I haven't, I haven't cracked the code yet, but I have to trust my instinct and I am very lucky to be, have, I, I'm lucky and I have good friends around me who are honest and, and transparent and are not afraid to tell me when I go right and, and when I do something wrong. So I constantly keep calibrating this. I think there's no substitute for, for experience. Um, you can't take a shortcut to experience. You have to work hard for many, many years to build this gut feeling. And the gut feeling is based on things you picked up and learned from other people, what feels right, uh, the experience you've, of what you see from making mistakes, for example. You learn from your mistakes and uh, little by little you get more confident. When you get too confident, you start making mistakes again. So, so it's a fine balance. And sometimes you're ahead and sometimes you're behind. Uh, for myself, I, I think that the most important ballast I have is growing up in nature. Mm. I, I'm calm inside. And when you're calm inside, you pick up uh, clearer uh, signals from other people from weather, from yourself, you are more aware. And to respond to what's really happening, you have to be aware and calm. If you're stressed or worried, or if there's too much noise in your head of ego or, or other things, you will not be responding to what's really happening. You will be reacting to what you think or you fear or you want to happen. Mm. You... I think I think that's my my greatest asset is that I'm I've learned to respond to what's really happening more than anything. And then very few things distract me and and um, take me out of that sort of Zen place. Very few things. Wow, that's that sounds like a superpower, especially in, in a, a line of work like yours, that, that there is such a need to stay present to what you're doing? I think it's transferable to many other areas of life too. You know, if you, mm. can, keep your, if you can keep your mind calm, you're, you're not going into a fight, flight, or freeze response to when things are happening. Stay curious, stay conscious. Uh, stay here and now in the present. You you use the word present, and which is a key word to being responsive and uh, conscious, is to be present here and now. And and I think it's transferable to family life. You the most important and dramatic things and 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 uh, challenging things we do as human beings are not to climb mountains. The most challenging things is bringing up children, living in a partnership or relationship, uh, friendships. Those are the really important challenges in our life. You know, 
nobody needs to climb a mountain. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't bring human beings uh, any further or, but on a personal level and then on a bigger scale, it's, it's important. But we're not like, I'm not, uh, if I go two times more to the North Pole or 10 times more, it will not improve the world in any significant way. But the inspiration I get or the insight I get from it, I might transfer and, and, and make a difference on the planet to to the people around me and to myself and, and hopefully to the world, hopefully one day. Yeah, well, I, I, I've heard some of the stories of the things you've been doing and and I think they are certainly inspiring many people, certainly inspiring the people who go with you. And um, and you, you worked with uh, with the first blind person to go to the South Pole. How, how did that go? Well, that was an incredible journey. So Mark Pollock, a hero and a friend of mine, mm -hmm. he uh, grew up in, in Hollywood in Belfast. It's a little area of Belfast called Hollywood. Not to be confused with the more famous... Uh, Hollywood in uh, in uh, West Hollywood or in in uh, LA. He oh, nine years before I met him, he he uh, he lost his eyesight from retinal detachment. He was a very active athlete, but uh, little by little his uh, eyesight deteriorated, and he, one day he was uh, legally blind. And um, he had this dream of doing something big to sort of feel that he was back up and kicking after turning blind. So 10 years, more more or less 10 years exactly after he turned blind, he skied to the South Pole. And he skied 1,000 kilometers to the South Pole. Uh, he fell over at least 1,000 times, stood up again, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's quite challenging terrain. But he did it. And it was a huge victory for him huge inspiration for me and, and to all the TV viewers that could see it on, on, on thin ice. Of course, um, stories like that doesn't mean that all blind people or all, all so-called disabled people should go and conquer the South Pole or, or Everest. It's just, he's just a good example that if you set your mind on something, if you have strong inner drive and inspiration, you can achieve incredible things. And for some people, that is getting over uh, a, a mental illness. For some people, it's a physical injury. For other people, there are other challenges that are that are their Everest or their South Pole. And and I love I love the fact that I was able to facilitate this journey for for Mark. Um, and I learned and and I had as much out of that as maybe him and, and other people around. So for me, it was a privilege. And, and I've been lucky to guide other people, uh, double amputees and um, people with uh, PTSD, mental injuries. And it's been extremely rewarding for me. And it made, made me feel less of a selfish, uh, um, like egocentric guy because... You know, it's it's quite um, it's quite uh, I don't know what the right word is, but it seems quite selfish to be just jetting around the world, going on ad going on adventures and getting paid for it. <laughs> um, so, working with the disabled people, helping people in general to push their limits and see their potential, and to inspire. Uh, others uh, makes makes it feel less selfish to do what I do. Uh, I'm still spoiled rotten, by the way. I'm so fortunate to be working uh, with the things that I do. It's it sounds amazing, and and that sounds like such a special experience and uh, and an inspiring story for so many people. You're also doing a um, a spot with CNN in the future, uh, a, a North Pole solo expedition. When's when's that coming up? The, the CNN project is a documentary and um, it happens to coincide with some North Pole training I'm doing now in April uh, on the North Pole and, and Spitsbergen. Um, but that that documentary would have been done uh, anyway, but it's, it's good content for that documentary. And it's being uh, shot the 
this month and and uh, the next two three months. So very interesting thing, a huge opportunity for me to to uh, show a little bit more of what I do. And uh, um, next year I'm planning a, a, a big expedition, a solo expedition, and um, I can't wait to to tell the world about that when it's uh, due to happen. All right. Well, Inga, before I ask my last question, if people want to follow along and hear about that kind of stuff in the future, where should they look for you online? I'm I'm quite visible and active on Instagram, and uh, I, I actually enjoy that. So just try to keep it uh, lighthearted and uh, inspirational. Like if I want to talk about uh, recycling, I'm not uh, I'm not telling people off. I'm showing things that they could do if I want to. Uh, I want to inspire people to go out and, and feel that they're part of nature. So hopefully that Instagram um, account will, will do exactly that. And I'm sharing a little bit of the private stuff, but not much. And then I have a website, which I never maintain, but it's ingesolheim.com. And that's a, that's a nice little, um, like a little brochure online. But uh, I'm easy, easy available and... Uh, and um, and active more on Instagram. All right. Well, we'll put uh, links to your website and to Instagram down in the show notes for anybody who's listening along and wants to check those out. That would be cool. All right. And my, my final question is, how can a leader make their team more robust? It's a really good question. And I, I think that um, the first thing a leader should do is try to get to know the people they're leading Mm. because people are different and different people and different circumstances uh, require different leadership and different uh, principles but i think the core principles should be respect and the leader should know as much as possible about the task and the people that are that he has to uh, that that he's asking to solve it um leadership is not an exact science and uh and i don't i haven't i've read many leadership books but i've never found one leadership book that is applicable to every situation and every person so so being curious and conscious about the way you lead people so that you can constant be learning constantly and um and evolving with the people you're leading and, and with the times, I think is key. Uh, the worst leader is the unconscious one mm. uh, who who don't know what he's doing or not interested in the effect he has on the people around him. And the other dangerous leader is the so-called strong leader who are usually, strong leaders are usually weak men uh, with strategies to to stay in control and uh, they are really dangerous you see them overrepresented in in big businesses in finance and in politics and they're usually very weak men with uh, with strategies to 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 have control because leadership leadership is more than just leading other people mm-hmm. leadership is also leading yourself mm-hmm. and and being your own best coach or or inspiration and it all starts so I think maybe we should talk more about responsibility. Please, because, yeah, yeah. And and when when you when you mention responsibility, I I feel that it's on it covers or it's uh, it's important on many different levels or areas in your life. You know, the first and most important responsibility is the personal responsibility you you have for yourself in your inner life and. And how you act, and and uh, who you are, and how you act—that is the biggest responsibility. Like you, you have to take responsibility for your own situation, for your own emotions. And it doesn't mean that you're responsible for what happened to you, but you're responsible for how you work on it, and how you respond to the world, and what the curveballs or the challenges the world throws at you. Uh, it can be other people's fault but your responsibility and and at the end of the day most things in your life you have to solve yourself either from the inside or from practical things around you 
uh, or relationships around you. And and the other responsibilities we have is is to to the people around us that depend on us and who love us and who uh, who look to us for answers and if we can stay kind and strong and and true and authentic i i think we will it's much clearer to us what that responsibility is and the same same uh, uh, principles also go into the wider sense of responsibility we have for the for the planet for 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 the environment and um if we get the, the first two right, so we're taking responsibility for ourselves and uh, the way we are, and then we take responsibility for the people around us, the people who are close to us. It, it, I think the third one, the the the, the overreach, the, the bigger picture is easier for us, and uh, we will make the right choices will take the right responsibility on a global scale if we get the other things right. So it's, part, it's kind of being in balance with yourself and your surroundings. Mm-hmm. And that is our responsibility. We can't blame people uh, for being out of balance with ourselves and the, and the world around us. We can come up with lots of excuses, but at the end of the day, we can change things in ourselves and, and the things that are near and close to us. And then if more, if many people do that, it changes the world. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's like you talked about before, about when you're in tune with oneself, you make better decisions, you see things better. It's, uh, it's huge. Yeah, you not uh, yeah, you, you see things better. Not always the truth. Like the truth is such a strange concept, you know, the truth is also mm. extremely subjective and, and depending on your the information you have, your point of view and perspective and stuff like that. And But I think you living true to yourself, uh, living, a authentic, living an authentic life and uh, being in balance with yourself, I, I think I don't know what it means, but I'm constantly work I'm, I'm constantly working on it and just it's it's a it's a very blurry concept and just like what people call mindfulness and stuff like that i i don't i don't know what it is but i'm i try to move towards something like that as much as i can people ask me if i meditate and i, I say well i'm not con- consciously meditating but i think i get a lot of meditation through my job and and just using little pockets of time and and consciously trying to calm my brain and my body and and yeah being present here and now i don't call it meditation i don't schedule it but i think i get it get a lot of it when i go on long expeditions i get silent retreat and meditation and all sorts of things for free um, without really wrapping it into some concept or, or packaging Many years ago, I read books about the astronauts and cosmonauts, the pioneers in space. And there was a phenomenon described by the psychologist called the overview effect. And the, the psychologists on, in both Russia and the United States who briefed and debriefed the astronauts, they described something called the overview effect, which was a change that had happened in the astronauts and cosmonauts when they came out, came back from space, the isolation and the perspective from outside of this planet changed their view of themselves and the planet and the whole. And I thought, I thought that was extremely interesting. And of course, I've always dreamt about going into space, but I think the, the idea of just leaving the matrix or leaving the, the normal and the, 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 the comfortable and and the safe sometimes and seeing it from the outside gives you a different perspective so the ultimate overview is of course seeing our planet from space from the moon for example but i think we can all lift our heads sometimes and, and and try to get a sense of the whole and i think that helps and i i think i've been very privileged to 
get some of that when I've been on long expeditions, like two, three months, leaving the matrix for long enough to calm down and to reconnect with nature properly and reconnect with myself away from all the noise and commercial impulses, uh, com commercial messages, um, all the people who want your attention, all the noise and the smells and all that stuff. When you leave it for long enough, your mind calms down and you see more clearly and you feel more clearly. Your um, It's kind of uh, your brain and your heart gets more resonance, I think. Yeah, I, I get that in, in small doses sometimes, which I love, yeah. I love about living in Malibu. I, I live uh, on the top of a mountain and I can, I can walk about a quarter mile to a beautiful lookout and I do that a couple times a day just to to step away from my work and things and and I look down on the ocean and, and maybe it's not as dramatic the the overview as from space but but even that I find even in small doses brings me back to center a little bit uh, so I totally believe that those small doses of overview and escape or break from break from the the everyday grind i think and step away from the noise for a few minutes or hours or days or weeks month months i think that's extremely important and valuable you just just like a computer needs processing time our brain needs processing time and we need to digest some of the impressions we're bombarded with all the time uh, i'm i think you're really lucky to be living in malibu because the energy from the pacific and uh, and uh, the whole energy in Malibu is beautiful and mm. it's so strange to know that you're only 30 minutes away from uh, the matrix of LA <laughs> and um, the noise and the traffic jams you're very fortunate to live out there yes it's it's a definitely a, a, a blessing that I, I think about probably every time I go to that lookout yeah yeah good I think I think a very important thing for me is to to say that I don't have all the answers. I, mm. I sound re I sound quite clear and determined and 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 um, loud when I speak about things that I'm passionate about. It doesn't. You are mean very direct. All, <laughs> yeah, my directness and and it doesn't mean that I have all the answers and and that that I speak the truth. I'm just passionate about and clear about what I believe in, and then. When I learn more, I believe more and different things. And uh, I think everyone needs to, 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 they need to distill out what sounds right for them from what I say, uh, hold it up against things that they have experienced themselves, and, and then come up with their point of view or their truth. And, and don't, don't be too attached to that truth. Be open to change, to mm -hmm. evolve. To learn new things, I think that's one of the big problems today. People go into their trenches, and and they the world is more polarized, and and people are too sure about things. It's almost uh, politics have turned into religion, uh, mm. religion has turned into politics and and <laughs> and business. It's it's all this polarization is dangerous for us. We need to to go back to individual thinking to to be more concerned about what's right to do than what is uh, socially acceptable to do it is because all the answers are inside us if you take away all the noise and the influence from religion or politics with a with a kind and clear mind you'll know the answer uh, too many people are followers Mm. And uh, I, the last thing I want is a following. Uh, I want to kick some butts. I want to inspire people. <laughs> I want to shake the comfortable a little bit to challenge the establishment so that people are more conscious about who they are, how they live. Well, Inga, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and sharing. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope that I didn't scare people with my uh, Norwegian directness. <laughs> you know, you just, your question just inspired me. <laughs> we love it. Thanks, Inga. Thank you. Everybody, that was Inga Solheim, one of the world's leading guides and explorers in the most extreme environments on Earth. And if you want to help us get more great guests like this on the show, then be sure to subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.